Okay, we are live. We are live. Well, Hi, everyone out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Sanjay. I am the director of Gather. We have Twyla Casador from San Carlos Apache. We have a Dave Briones, Coach D. Kiowa, calling from California. Twyla, to begin our session, can I ask you to in, invoke or acknowledge in any way you'd like to? I have my mom. She's going to do the prayer. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much to Twyla, her mother, obviously sacred and, and very, very special to have that to begin today. As all of you know, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. A day. As someone who is deeply involved with indigenous rights activities across Turtle Island, across the 573 federally recognized tribes, the hundreds of more not federally recognized tribes and the thousands of more bands and peoples that define indigeneity. What does Indigenous Peoples Day mean to you right now in October, 2020? What a good question, Sanjay. Well, first let's, I, 574 federally recognized tribes and um, I don't say conquer, I say like lost sailor, especially today. The lost sailors who found their way, they were looking for you, Sanjay, and found their way, found their way to America. And um, I think what does indigenous people, they mean today? It means Twyla and it means her mom. It means like the celebration of who we are, not just today, but every day. It's just today is like hy be hyper indigenous. Um, my grandpa always said like it's indigenous people's day is every day for us because that's just how we we live and breathe. And so I, I welcome the world into that breath today. Twyla, how about you? What does indigenous people's day mean for you? Did we freeze? I'm I'm losing you guys. I'm going in and out with the video. So it's kind of freezing and and then I'll just get bits and pieces. Well, maybe if it's okay, if you turn your video off, um we'll I mean we'll miss your beautiful face, but at least you'll be able to hear us and participate clearly. As people watching might know, there are some real and serious rural bandwidth issues across America, but no more greater than many places in Indian country. Twyla has the fastest Wi-Fi in the Apacheria, but that obviously isn't as quick as the Wi-Fi <laughs> I have in New York City. Um, so Twyla, what, what does Indigenous Peoples Day mean to you? Um, to me, Indigenous Day means um, 
everything we've overcome as indigenous people, the resiliency that we have, the ability to continue and carry on what our ancestors have, have taught us and carried with us. I mean, it's just like watching a plant grow and just watching it keep growing and knowing that plant's never gonna die because that's what us indigenous people are. We're always growing and we're always gonna continue to thrive. We're always gonna continue to be here. We're always gonna be continued sharing our prayers and our healing ways with the world, regardless of how we're treated. A day in terms of political context for today. Obviously, a lot of folks know what happened in Standing Rock a few years ago and how that was a real coming together for this generation of Native activists and the political solidarity that that created. At the same time, people might not know how political food is and that it might not be the day-to-day -day battle against a bulldozer like we saw on the news with extractive um, forces coming into Indian country. But why is food sovereignty so important right now? Yes, Standing Rock is like, I think, a mark in indigenous history, just like Wounded Knee was. But it is also important to realize that almost every tribe in this country has its own standing rock. Like these, these environmental threats and um, activities happen in every part of our country, almost to every tribe. I don't know one tribe that hasn't had to face um, environmental actors or corporate actors in the protection of our resources. It's just Standing Rock was pretty special because there was so, many, so much attention and social media was used by some of our young people in ways that we were able to see um, vast conversations and actually see real time what was happening. I think that's, that's the importance of Standing Rock. But in terms of food sovereignty, you know, when I talk to some of the folks that we work with at First Nations, most of the hunters and the fishermen and the gatherers, like they don't always say, I'm, I'm in food sovereignty. Like they are participating and they are doing activities um, that their ancestors have done, that they wanna teach their grandchildren. And it's not like this special specialized subject area. It's sort of just like existing as indigenous people, meeting the obligations that we have to our lands and our environment and really protecting um, the sanctity of, of like our instructions. Like this is, this is, we were created as a people and as communities to protect our lands, to protect our animals, to protect each other, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of everyone around us. And so like food sovereignty means all of that in two little words that are not often used um, internally within Indian country sort of like, I'm a, I'm a farmer, I'm a fisherman, I'm a hunter, which to me carries as much weight as the term food sovereignty. But you know, it's, it's easier for people to say food sovereignty like as a movement, but really there is no movement. Like we've been doing this, there's no end and no beginning, just as Twyla said, to, to our resiliency and our obligations and what we do to protect our land and our food sources. Wonderful. So as, as people may or may not know, the three of us made a film together called Gather. A day is an executive producer along with First Nations Development Institute, as well as Hawaiian activist and actor Jason Momoa. Twyla is one of the stars of the movie. The film is available on iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo On Demand, there are a lot of free virtual screenings happening around the country right now, but we would love to show everybody a special nine minute clip of the movie, which we called The Hunt, which was created especially for Emergence Magazine. And I think after you see this video, you'll really see a side of Twyla that you might not get with her sitting down in her house. So I would love if um, Julia might be able to cue up that video for us right now. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for 
sharing this film with everyone. For folks who haven't watched the whole film, Gather, it's available on iTunes, on Amazon, on Vimeo, on demand. We're gonna begin doing a lot of campus screenings shortly. This was just one part. I love this part, but we've got great, great stories from Cheyenne River Lakota, from Elsie Dubray, her family, from the Yurok tribe, Hupa Karuk on the Klamath River with the ancestral guard. But Twyla, um, I think Twyla, you and Aday are still muted right now. But Twy Twyla, can you give us a little bit of the history of this beautiful animal, the Glosjo, and what your first introduction to it was? Okay. The Glosjo has been a part of, you know, different Apache bands. Not all Apache bands ate Glosjo. And Glosjo was introduced, well, people knew about Glosjo. And during the time when the reservation was developed, a lot of people couldn't go out and hunt and forage like they used to, but Glusha was abundant. And adapting is also came, coming to a form of a, adaptation. But for myself, I grew up with my brothers. We would hunt it, cook it, eat it. You know, it's just something I naturally grew up with. It's just like how people go to the grocery stores and buy some groceries. We would go out and hunt rabbit, hunt quail, hunt um, Glusha, and we would cook all these. And sometimes we would just, you know, have tortillas with us and we just go out and cooking out there. We'll just get like a little metal can, little coffee can, take it along and just cook it. And for me, I grew up with it, but I grew up on the outside of a community, not close to the community at large and, and not knowing that a lot of people did not eat this like we do, you know, we grew up on um, with a large garden with cattle in the in the yard um we grew up uh, hunting foraging so it's a little bit different when i went to the school and, and you see food you know different kind of food and it's not too far off you know i'm not that old but i grew up i'm blessed to grow up with parents that appreciate you know you know heart the traditional way of life and traditional food and but for me, I just grew up with it. So reintroducing it to people or just people that have memories of it and sharing it with them again, it's just, it's just exciting. Beautiful, Twyla. Thank you. Ade, there's been a lot of discussion recently, publicly, but you've seen it for years around regenerative farming, around permaculture, um, techniques that really just scratch the surface of traditional ecological knowledge. I guarantee that no permaculture out there has ever taught anybody about the importance or the power of animals like the pack rat, like Golosho. Can you speak a little bit about traditional ecological knowledge and really how remarkable people like Twyla are, even if they don't have PhDs from Stanford in agronomy or genetics. Yeah, that's a um, funny question because I, you know, of course I grew up in Kochiti with um, indigenous food practitioners who were brilliant, brilliant and who would, um, and I think of them often, you know, I do have degrees in agriculture. Um, and one of the, I guess, poignant parts of learning in an academic institution is that you recite a shared history and the history begins with agriculture as the dividing line between the civilized and the uncivilized, despite the fact that indigenous people have always been um, land stewards, Farmers, hunters, fishermen, those things weren't recognized in the inception of this idea in agriculture. And so everything that comes after that point is built on that false notion of agriculture being like a civilizing force because it's just kind of made up. Even though like in America, yes, we see 
like land landowners and like the first farmers from coming from Europe, um, you know, kind of staking their claims on that terminology. But in fact, like indigenous people were probably um, much better suited to the land that we lived on, um, if not farming it in much in very sophisticated ways by the time contact happened, which is like a perfect conversation today on Indigenous Peoples Day. And so when we talk about traditional ecological knowledge, which is again, it's a it's a term that's like so broad, it really doesn't mean anything. Like when we think about Twyla and her knowledge and how it's very attached to the land base from which she comes, that's like the body of knowledge. And in, in general, we call that traditional ecological knowledge, but really that's just like the gateway into something that's much deeper and broader and much more nuanced and localized. And so when we use terms like permaculture, agroecology or regenerative agriculture, these are sort of like concepts that are missing in the original term American agriculture. And you know, at some point somebody said, I'm gonna live with indigenous people or watch indigenous people and they get excited and they're like, oh my gosh, we're gonna call this something else than what it is. Like something else than Apache, something else than Kochipi, something else than Kiowa. I mean, so to me, like these are just termolo terminologies that are like the door, you're just opening the door into something much grander and bigger and to really like flood yourself with these knowledge bases, you have to spend time with Tyler. You have to spend time in the communities um, that, that live these knowledge, that breathe this knowledge, that, have, that are fighting to protect this knowledge despite all the intrusions and disruptions that have happened to us over time, both from the federal, federal level to the state level to the internal level, like the social pressures to conform to American society is really hard. And so like gems like Twyla and my sister over there just remind us to embrace our indigenous, to embrace our ghost show. <laughs> you, you, you spoke of, of two key points. Number one, the surface level notion of invisibilizing indigenous contributions. But then at the end, you hinted towards the conscious aspect of that invisibilizing and in essence, the, the penalization of the practicing of traditional ecological knowledge. For those in the know, they'll recognize that there's a corollary in Indian country to the example for in African-American urban communities of the school to prison pipeline where minor infractions are pushed into the criminal justice system and people can get misdemeanors and felonies for things that would really barely even require detention. We've seen the state trained against Native Americans in various forms but that criminal law enforcement also used to attempt to punish natives for harvesting food. There's a million examples, but Twyla, can you tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 restrictions in Arizona were used to actively penalize San Carlos Apache um, from foraging acorns? Yes, um, we've experienced, I mean, COVID-19 did a lot to everybody worldwide, globally. For us, it really minimized the amount of people's ability to go out and harvest and forage. I know for ourselves, for the tribe at the moment, at that moment, due to large concerns, there were fines for people that left the reservation. We have to leave the reservation in order to forage some of these foods that we don't have access to on the reservation. And then also neighboring communities, they would neighboring cities or a town, they will find you a thousand dollars. And we've experienced that firsthand in one of the neighboring towns is, you know, seeing, seeing your relative get fined a thousand dollars just for foraging um, acorn. And 
it was within guidelines. I believe it was in guidelines because they weren't in distance of anyone. They were away from the community. They were just doing what they normally do. But that kind of put, um, I would say, some type of um, trauma in this family where like, okay, we can't go to that community anymore. And I'm like, no, it, it's just they're, they're overreacting about this COVID. But to, to find a person for foraging was another thing to me. But I can see if it was for some type of a violation like um, DUI or something, but not just for foraging. So yes, it did, it did um, happen. And yes, it's something I think we all can learn from and how to share and network. I mean, I, it's something we have to collaborate on in some form because this isn't the only thing that's gonna happen to us in life. There are other things that are gonna happen to us. How are we gonna address that? How are we gonna prepare our community for that? How are we gonna look at policies that can help us and protect us during these times, you know, using our traditional practices so we don't lose it? Wow. Can I, I'm just going to jump in there, Sanjay, because this makes me so angry. And we have a scene in Gather where our Hoopa friends are saying, like, you know, we've fought all kinds of wars. And now we're back here at the same war trying to fight for our food. And that is exactly where we are. Like, okay, it's not 18, the 1800s when they put us on reservations, but it is. Like, if you're telling us that we can't go off our reservation to get our traditional foods, you know, it, it, what has changed? And I think we see this across the board. We see our hunters getting fined for, by game wardens by the state. We see fishermen who are being told they can't fish. We see acorn forgers. And like, I saw a picture of a grandma who was forging acorns. I mean, this is like, like wake up America. Like this is we're practicing land stewardship, not just for us, but for everyone. And it's like, when, when are we going to say like things have to change? Because yes, we have terms like agroecology and traditional ecological knowledge and all these, these ways to connect to one another, but our people are still being prosecuted for being indigenous off whatever land base, you know, that we were put on so that everybody else could have access to our lands like this like what has changed and I think that's something we all have to ask ourselves like what has really changed if we still see people getting prosecuted for doing very and I'm not going to say minor but they're they're collecting acorns geez you know like it's frustrating it is so frustrating I mean the, the uh, obviously for those who watch gather they they realize that you know, the, the framing starts in the 1400s. The first colonial economies that came here were completely based on trying to extract enormous amounts of wealth from the topsoil. There was no petroleum, there was no other real industries on Turtle Island other than farming. They stole Native American farms. They couldn't get enough, quote, free labor here. So they imported agrarian experts, peasants from Africa, but we see the corollary. We see the psychological warfare by law enforcement against African-Americans today to effectively try to subjugate them into the slave master relationship. But the flip side, right, is with Indian country, it's been the land that's always been coveted. So there is a slate of federal policies to continue extraction, to separate natives from their land, and to create limitations for access to food and supply chains to reach Indian country. So Ade, in terms of COVID-19, how is Indian country adapting to this like purposeful negligence by all the federal organizations that have been basically established to support Americans and even those set up treaty-wise to support Indian country? That's a really good question because I think during COVID-19 we saw two very real examples of what's going on in our country. And there's an internal reflection and reaction to COVID-19 in Indian country, and there's an external one. Let's start with the external one, which is like when we see 
Indian country is at the end of every supply chain. Most communities have to drive 50, if not more miles to go get a gallon of milk or go get groceries. And so when you're at the, that means because we're, the supply chain doesn't even reach us. We have to go travel to the end of that supply chain. So when there's breakdowns in that supply chain anywhere in it, we're affected at the end. And so you saw food shortages in some, very real food shortages in some parts of Indian country. And so the response, of course, by philanthropy and the government is like, let's move food to these places because there's food shortages. But internally, it just reinforced the idea that we need to be, um, we need, a, we need our traditional food system. You see people turning to seeds, you see people turning to hunting, you see people foraging again. And this like reflection that we need to feed ourselves became very real and it just, it just mm -hmm. exemplified the differences between food security, which is about like protein and calories and food sovereignty, which is about the people and the land and ensuring that both of those things are healthy, we see stark differences in COVID-19 for sure. And so I think when it comes, but then at the same time, you know, during COVID-19, I think we see more, more prosecutions of, for trespassing, more prosecutions for fishing out of season or hunting out of season. And, you know, it's like this, we're living in this very different world. Like people don't see how like trespassing infractions will follow these, per these young people or even these old people for a very, very long time. And, and so like COVID-19 has some real consequences for Indian country for sure. Twyla, you know, we, we, we were blessed to kind of see the and th this, this is a corollary from, from my own culture, East India, where knowledge isn't passed to people through books. Knowledge is passed from an elder or from a teacher or from a big sister or big brother. It's really dependent on that relationship that the real subtleties of traditional spiritual, traditional ecological knowledge is passed down. So it was wonderful to showcase and gather um, your relationship with young May and taking her out, not just for the Glosho hunt, but to harvest sunflowers, to harvest indigenous bananas. Have you been able to take youth out to forage during COVID or recently? And what was that like for the kids, especially in this day and age? Um, during this COVID, no, uh, where we have really um, tight restrictions during this time and it's not to be around people or not to be gathering people, uh, they, they limited a lot. So a lot of that is being lightly lifted. And so far I have gone, uh, personally I've just gone, I've just gone, I go pick up some people that want to go and sometime I go visit like different families that would want to go and harvest like these amazing like these pinons here you know to the pinons and this um it has its challenges but it still has its interest i have people that will call and wonder when we're going to do these field trips i know my the people well, some of the people i work with go out go out regardless of the restrictions it's just some things you just have to carry on and do as far as information, it's just giving out the information that we do have, you know, either by phone or video or, you know, just talking to people in a, in a how you say, in a very um, mindful way, but sharing the food is, is, how you say, some of the challenges. Uh, one of the best things about, the, not best thing about COVID, but one of the positive things about COVID was being able, even though we're not talking to people, but we're sharing seeds. So we're seeing from last year, maybe like 40, 50 gardens to over 160, close to 200 this year. And a lot of it was based on food security and food, um, you know, just a concern about food because like how, how Ade was saying, we have to go a long way for food. And you're looking at fresh produce, fresh produce goes like very hard to find because of COVID. 
But seeing that positive part was seeing a lot of people actually engage in gardening more than foraging this, this, um, during this past six months. So it has its up and down, but going with young people, there's a strong interest. I mean, a lot of people are still excited. They have people waiting for this, this, all these restrictions to be lifted so we can go back out again. So Twyla, how can people support you? Oh, support, yes, greatly needed. Okay, Western Apache Diet Project. I'm out of St. Carlos, Arizona, St. Carlos Forestry Program. Um, a Jeep Rubicon would be really nice. <laughs> I have to say, my vehicle just broke down. I went to your own picking and I don't know what happened, but something happened. So I do take my personal vehicle out and we go out and um, I just take whoever, you know, if people want to go, I'll take them. I'm not going to say no. And a lot of it is just using what you have. And knowing that they're so excited, you know, they're so excited. You want to kill that excitement. You want them to be able to share. So the other day I took a, a family out and the man had gone out pinion picking before with other people, but his kids never have. And these are people that are, um, have some issues, but they're working with it. But these, their kids were so excited just to be out there. You know, they sat in the back of the truck and they went out and forward. And going back to um, how can they support you? Yes, Western Apache Diet Project, uh, St. Carlos, Arizona. Uh, you can probably find us online. And I'll be crossing my finger, Jeep Rubicon. <laughs> and people can also hit you up on Instagram. They can find you. Oh, pretty yes, you can find me on Instagram. And you can also find me on, uh, what is it called? Yeah, Instagram is probably the best one. And then on Ven on Venmo as well, because everything helps your work. Oh yes, you can find me on Venmo. Um, Sanjay can give you that information and that would be great. Are you still there? Can you yeah. still see me? Yes, yeah, so they, they share the screen where people can mm -hmm. see Twyla's Instagram handle, um, which is great. Thanks so much, Growing Culture. Uh, hit her up through DMs, you know, five, 10, $15, means a lot when Twyla needs to take people out for a life-changing experience. That's gas money. She can take one girl or one boy out for six or seven hours and they're changed forever. And this change just isn't through knowledge transfer. Transfer. It's through them reconnecting with who they are, who their people are, where they've come from, apart from what colonization has tried to impart on them. A day, how can people support you? I, I, I know that you, you're always looking for basket grass, but beyond that. <laughs> well, that's important, right? Like there's so many traditional artists and traditional um, people. So if you have land and you want to learn about your land, I'm sure we can connect you with indigenous people who probably know about plants and animals and ecosystems on those land bases. So landowners are always um, welcome to contact me because we can always connect you with indigenous people. Firstnations.org, um, you know, look at hashtag land back. That, that's an important movement right now. But also um, First Nations, we're always grateful for support, but our main goal is to get people to support um, tribal communities and food projects directly. So if you go to firstnations.org, we have a grant database that's searchable um, that has all our grants from the early 80s till now. And there you can search by state or by, by keyword and you can find projects and communities that are close to you. And the film Gather has been made available to any and every Indian country organization free of charge, thanks to First Nations. You can send them a direct message through Instagram. For academic institutions, organizations that aren't on tribal nations, they can send us a message at Gather Film. You know, COVID-19 has created a number of different opportunities distribution-wise. Obviously, panels like this used to have to be in person, and now we can speak about this to the world from the safety and security of our living rooms. At the same time, 
we have different platforms that we're using to organize group virtual screenings where friends, relatives, organizations can all gather together and watch the wonderful film that's infused with the spirit of Twyla, Chef Nephi Craig, Clayton Harvey from the People's Farm on White Mountain Apache, Yurok Kids from the Ancestral Guard, Elsie Dubray from Cheyenne River Lakota, Her Danielle Hill from the Mashpee. Hopefully we give a good representation of Indian culture all over Turtle Island. But um, Ade, do you have any parting words for us? Yes. It's Indigenous Peoples Day. Learn something new about the Indigenous people around you. And I think I always like um, to say we are still here. And so um, recognizing and saying Indigenous people are still here, this, this is a great time to actually practice that and know that and feel that and um, support Twyla. Twyla, thank you so much for helping us start this beautiful hour with your mother. How is it, well, can you give us some final words in this panel? Um, like Ade was saying, yes, go out and get, learn about your community, what's in there, touch the land, touch the ground, touch mother earth. And, you know, I'm just so thankful. Um, also, as far as um, support also, there's I Collective. I did forget to mention I Collective, amazing group of indigenous chefs throughout all of Turtle Island. And you can find them on Instagram, I Collective. And just, you know, let's continue to heal together. And, and we're gonna make this a better place for our future generations. And I believe that very strongly that our future generations are really the key to what's keeping us alive and keeping us moving. So again, with that, um, Asha, Ahia, and happy Indigenous Day. And thank you for all your support. And for all those tuning in, of course, you guys are following a growing culture. There are very few organizations like this that are committed to oneness amongst people through equity, through justice, through deep spiritual reflection, helping to create the bonds that will truly make a better world for all of us, for uplifting indigenous, other BIPOC farming communities, peasant farmers around the world. If you have friends that are looking for the truth and really, really woke perspectives on what's going on out there in the food world, please tag them on a growing culture on Instagram. And I wanna say a personal shout out to May, who is in the background of this film poster, to Kim Baca, to Elsie Dubray, and all those who've contributed their spirits and their hearts like Twyla and Ade have together. Thank you guys very, very, very much. <laughs>